Please state your name and age. Eric Hamill, 37. How long have you had this monkey on your back? 12, 13 years. Eric, what if I told you this monkey could kill you very soon? <laughs> My grandpa had one and he lived. Eric, what if I told you this monkey was gonna kill you right now? Do you want me to stop it? Yeah. When it comes to tobacco, the choice should be this simple. Let's snuff the monkey before it snuffs you. Next. Please state your name and age. Lexi James, and I'm 24. And you're here because of a friend that wants to help you get rid of this thing. Yeah, but, but I don't... You feel you can get rid of this monkey cold turkey, correct? Yeah. I, I mean, I've never really been dependent on it, and I think that when I... 5% of people that attempt to quit tobacco cold turkey actually succeed. Let us help you ditch the monkey. Have you ever considered any other methods? Without the bird. Next. Okay, this is going to be Get Kicked Sunday. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking on overcoming addiction. And you pretty much don't have to worry because everybody's going to qualify for something. You're going to get kicked this morning. And I'm going to get kicked too, so don't get excited. Um, the word addiction. How do you define the word addiction? Well, you know, here we often do this, and I'm going to do it again this morning. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Uh, you're going to see how words change meaning over time. Webster's 1828. Addiction. Noun. Uh, quote, the act of devoting or giving up in practice the state of being devoted. Hmm. That's Webster's 1828 Dictionary. What about Webster's 1955? Addiction. Noun. Quote, the condition of being addicted to a habit, habitual inclination. Hmm. That's what most of us think about addiction today. But back in 1828, addiction was actually a positive thing. And we're going to see that towards the end of the sermon, that addiction is actually something that you should have. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that you need to get rid of all addictions and then you'll have things straightened out. That's not going to happen. Your flesh is going to become addicted to things. You are a creature of habit. <laughs> you know, it's been well said. Okay, I'm not going to advocate elimination of all addictions. I'm going to advocate replacement of harmful addictions with good addictions. <laughs> That's what this sermon's going to be about. Um, but how does the Bible define addiction? Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, I think really defines what we would call addiction today. This is another one of those verses that you should really know and understand. It says here, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now, we're going to see that as we continue through this study, a lot of the things that you can become addicted to will actually keep you under their power. It will become a habit that is very hard to break. It literally will have power over you, have power over your life. Now, what about different types of addiction? Now, what's the, the first thing that most people think of? Alcohol. Alcohol, drugs, yeah. and cigarettes. Okay. That's what most people think of when they think of addiction. They, you say somebody's an addict, they think of drugs, alcohol, or cigarettes. That's what most people think about. Okay? And we're going to talk about those, but we're also going to talk about some addictions that you might not be as comfortable with. <laughs> okay? Some that you might have in your life. In fact, I can almost guarantee you that uh, you will. Uh, we're not going to turn here, but Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 through 10 says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will yet, or be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Pro Proverbs 27, verses 5 and 6 says, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Okay, I'm not going to tell you these addictions today and say, now, it was a result of, a, of your childhood or something like that. It's an inherited trait. Uh-uh. I'm going to do a little bit of wounding today. But it's because I'm your friend. 
It's because I want to do, you know, I'm doing this message to help uh, Christians out there. I'm not doing this as a thing of just kicking you and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, I, I will say this. A lot of preachers out there, they'll go down through this list of addictions, which I'm going to go over today, and there's certain ones that they'll fall for. But then there's other ones that they don't have a problem with. And I've heard these guys, and they will just, they'll pick addictions that they don't have any temptation in, and then they'll blast people that are tempted in those areas. You know, and they'll just tear you down, and you're probably not even saved, and rah, 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 they'll rip you to pieces because they don't have a problem with that addiction. You know, I'll just give you a good example. I have no temptations in the area of alcohol. None. I have never been tempted to go out and get drunk. Never been a temptation for me. So it'd be real easy for me to tear into people that have had problems with alcohol. You know, because see, I don't have a problem with that addiction. But then there are other addictions which I'm going to be talking about today that I do have a problem with and that I do struggle with. And, you know, a lot of these preachers, they'll kind of be quiet about those things. <laughs> Got to watch out for that. And as I said earlier, I am actually going to be promoting some addictions here as we can, as uh, towards the end of the study. All right, now the addiction, the first one we're going to talk about is alcohol. Turn back to the book of Proverbs in your Old Testament. Proverbs chapter 23. The Bible has a lot to say about addictions and, and things like that, uh, problems with the flesh. The Bible is the greatest book that's ever been written. It's an instruction manual for the, you know, the body of man. And you'll see how that God knows exactly what goes on with how our bodies work, how our minds think. And he knows exactly what goes on with a drunk. We're going to see that here. Proverbs chapter 23, starting at verse 29. It says here, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? Well, that's a lot of questions there. Well, who has all those things? Verse 30, They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth his collar in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. It's kind of funny because wine is fermented grape juice. And most alcohol is rotten liquid. <laughs> kind of interesting. And if you drink it enough, it'll actually eat holes in your uh, liver. Cirrhosis of the liver. You know, kind of weird to be drinking something like that. I mean, if you go out and you see this old rain barrel and it's got this rain water in it that's been in there for a week or two and it's got rotted leaves in it and everything, you know, fermented water, you wouldn't think about drinking that. But you put a fancy label on it and you put it in a bar somewhere and, oh, you know, I'll drink that stuff. It's rotten liquid. <laughs> that's what alcohol is. Kind of weird to drink a thing like that. Verse 32, At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. You know, there's plenty of fornication that goes on at bars. You know, plenty of it. Not a good place to find a wife, <laughs> uh, if you're a man. Verse 34, Yea, thou shalt be, be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. Did you ever go out on, on a boat? out to sea and the things moving all around and you start feeling kind of seasick you know that's not a positive thing <laughs> why would you want to drink a liquid that would make you feel that way but by the way let me just say something here before i continue before people get all excited it says there in verse 30 they that tarry long at the wine you know you can make arguments that people can drink a little bit of wine or something like that that's not what's being rebuked here. Somebody just taking a, a drink of wine or something like that, or one cup of wine. I personally stay away from it. I don't Amen. want anything to do with it. Yep. You know, you know, you can you can drink it and still be saved. Well, all things are lawful, but they're not expedient. And I I know my flesh, my flesh is weak, and if I drink something and I know it makes me feel 
better and I kind of forget my problems for a little bit, I know that my flesh might have a tendency to lean towards that stuff. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to be seen walking into an alcohol store. You know, well, you're just going in to buy a little tiny bit or just have one little drink. The people outside don't know that. Amen. Stay away from that whole atmosphere. There's a restaurant not too far from here, the Kville House, they call it. It's this really old hotel, and they, they say the, the food there is excellent. But guess what? There's beer signs in the windows, the neon signs, you know, Coors Light and, and Bud Beer and whatever else. I'm not going to go in there. You know, well, you're just going in to eat food. Yeah, but guess what the people think when they see me going in there? Am I going to park my truck out there with fear God on the front and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved on the back? Boy, what a testimony that would be. You know, and you know what the lost world would say. They'd say, oh, there's a preacher in there, you know, in a bar. You know, I stay away from it. Can you drink it and still be saved? Yeah, sure. But if you start to tarry long at the wine, that's when things are going to start going to pieces. You're going to start feeling sick, like there in verse 34. Verse 35 says, They have stricken me, uh, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that weird? You go through that sickness, you know, the, uh, uh, what do they call that? The next morning hangover. hangover yeah you go through the hangover and you and you throw up and everything else and you you know oh i feel terrible and the next night you go out and you get drunk and do it all over again it's crazy why would you do that you know i had the benefit of of having a uh, my father was in ambulance work and he would come home and he'd tell us these stories of these drunk driving accidents and they'd be out there, they'd be trying to bandage this guy up, and he'd be ripping the bandages off and everything. You get some guy that's really, you know, loaded up on alcohol, and he's in an accident, they don't even feel it. You know, exactly what the Bible says there. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. Oh, the Bible's not scientific. Yes, it is. Right there. Right there you have it. So there's the first type of addiction that you see there. Interestingly, it says about... In the last sentence there, I will. Uh, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Second Peter two twenty two says, but it has happened unto them according to the true true proverb: the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. <laughs> That's what God thinks about the lost world, and they'll do that. You'll see that. Pretty bad. Turn next to Second Corinthians chapter ten. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. The next addiction, and one that just keeps getting worse and worse and worse, is uh, drugs. There are a lot of drugs out there that will just mess you up. And uh, it's amazing to me how people will use anything if they think that they can get high off of it. You know, the new thing now, which I don't know how, how new it is, you know, it might have been around for years, but it's new to me. I just heard about it, is a thing of bath salts. Mm -hmm. People will take bath salts and cook them or something, and they breathe in the fumes or inject the <laughs> liquid or I don't even know what. And, you know, it can destroy your mind the first time you use it. Why would you want to do that? See, it's bad. Not a good idea. Drugs are a real bad thing. But here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, if you're on drugs, can you bring every thought into obedience, to the, obe into, uh, to the obedience of Christ? No, you can't. And by the way, Drugs aren't just the type of thing that you go out on the street corner and buy. There are other types of drugs, some of which can be prescribed. Yep. And if you are on some kind of a drug and it causes you to not have control over your thoughts, you better do something and get off of that. It's bad news. But there's another type of addiction. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3 says... Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. 
And of course, we're going to get into that a little bit more later when we look at a, a good type of addiction. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Next type of addiction we're going to talk about. I'm not going to be covering all these in real super great detail because there's a lot of other things I want to talk about, but uh, the next type of addiction is smoking. Cigarettes, pipe, uh, cigars, whatever. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Also another very familiar part of Scripture. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You're right there, we have a wood stove. You can't see it, of course, in the recording, but we have a wood stove right over here that we heat this place with in the winter time. Now, how would it be if we decided, hey, you know what? Let's take that pipe off of there, that stove pipe off of there. Let's get a good fire going in there. Well, before too long, you'd have this whole room filled up with smoke. Would that be a good place to worship? No. Why would you do it to your own body? Hmm. You know, it's interesting. Job chapter 41, verse 19 through 21. I'll read this quick. It says, speaking about Leviathan, Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke. <laughs> As out of a seething pot or cauldron, his breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. Kind of interesting there that uh, one of the descriptions of Satan as the dragon, as Leviathan, you know, and it talks about smoke going out of his nose, his nose, his nostrils. <laughs> That's what people that smoke do. You know, nothing more attractive than a woman with smoke coming out of her nose, you know, like a fire breathing dragon. Not a good addiction. And you say, oh, but you know, I don't think Christians would be involved in such things. Mm. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. I know of a couple. You know, I know there's a guy on, on uh, the Internet that makes videos and things, and he's a professing Christian, and different times he'll be smoking a cigar. And, you know, I think the guy's probably saved. But what a testimony. What a testimony to the lost world. It's just not right. Okay, and what's the next addiction? Pornography. Another one of the more serious addictions. Uh, Psalm 101 verse 3 says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. You know, for some weird reason, the thing of pornography, it'll cleave to you. It'll stay in your mind for years and years and years to come. You'll forget other things, but you'll remember those images. That's something else. Uh, Leviticus chapter 20 verse 17 says, And if a man shall take his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, and see her nakedness, and she see his nakedness, it is a wicked thing, and they shall be cut off in the sight of their people. He hath uncovered his sister's nakedness. He shall bear his iniquity. And of course there's more involved there. you know. But the point is, it starts with seeing somebody's nakedness, and it's a shameful thing. Now, obviously, between married couples, that's fine. The marriage bed is undefiled and holy before the Lord. Fine. But when it comes to relatives or to other people, you shouldn't be seeing nakedness. It should be a shameful thing. You know, the Bible talks about there the uh, Laodiceans, and it says, Anoint thine eyes with the eye salve, you know, and, and that you're to have, be clothed with righteousness, and fine linen of righteousness, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Nakedness in the Bible is associated with shame. What happened to Adam and Eve? When they, when their eyes were open, they saw that they didn't have anything on and they were ashamed. It's not normal to want to be nude publicly. That's wrong. It shouldn't be that way. And the man that was possessed with devils, by the way, what was his condition? He wasn't wearing anything either. Pornography is not a good thing, and there are people that are very much addicted to it. I mean, some of the studies, I read about this in my pornography epidemic, they have Christian men's retreats, and they ask for, well, I don't, maybe not a show of hands, but they take surveys. Up to 90% of those men admit to looking at pornography within the last month. Christian men. 
professing Christians. What's it like in the lost world? It's bad news. Is that an addiction? Yep. Mm -hmm. And if you want to hear more on that, I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover all the details, but if you want to hear more, you can listen to the pornography epidemic uh, message on that. But that's certainly an addiction. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're not going to be able to just eliminate it. Okay? By going to counseling or to, to some other thing, you can't just eliminate that. It's going to take you replacing that addiction with something else. And we're going to talk about that later. On to the next addiction. Luke chapter 15. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Go there next. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. This is another one that's another big addiction, which a lot of people don't want to think about, but it's gambling. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus tells a story here. It says here, And he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, in that land, and he began to be in want. Now, it doesn't come right out and say that he gambled or anything, but that could have been one of the things that was included there in the riotous living. Could be he was just going and throwing his money around and whatever else. But I'll tell you, one of the worst types of riotous living is when you take hard-earned money and you put it on a table or something like that and you bet it and you lose it all. Again, I have no temptation in that area. I think it's stupid to do something like that. <laughs> you know, I realize how hard it is to make money and I'm not going to bet it. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. But, uh, you know, it's kind of funny. Uh, one of the statements about Las Vegas, that's, you know, when you think gambling, most people think Las Vegas. They say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. <laughs> you know, that's a, some perversion stuff there going on. But the fact of the matter is, it's actually true. <laughs> because what happens in Vegas is you go there to these big casinos and most people, you have some people that'll win. They gotta, you know, allow that occasionally so people don't rise up and riot or something. But most people, they go there and they lose their hard-earned money. So what happened in Vegas is they went, they gave the casino their money, they lost it, and then they leave. So th their money came to Vegas and it stayed in Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not going to leave. You know? And you say, well, you know, I'd never go to Las Vegas. You know, I know professing Christians that have and that go and gamble, you know. I don't know why you'd ever be caught dead in a place like that, unless you're street preaching. But uh, Or driving truck. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just driving through, passing through, right? Even that specs. Uh, yeah, that specs in Brian. Yeah, I'm sure. But uh, the fact of the matter is, I don't know why a Christian would take the money that God's given them and gamble it away. You say, well, I'd never go to a place like Las Vegas. So I wouldn't be caught dead. Okay, do you play the lottery? Mm -hmm. You play the lottery? Well, you know, the, the, the proceeds from the lottery help older uh, uh, people. Uh, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, sure, tell me all about it. Genesis chapter 3, turn there next. I'm going to show you what God expects. Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. Here we have... Adam and Eve getting kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3.17 says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. 
did, I, I didn't see anything in there about taking your hard-earned living and gambling it so you can get rich quick. I, I must have missed that. Maybe that was in the originals or something. No, God's will is for you to work and work hard for your living. You know why? Because then you appreciate it. God's will is not for you to go out and buy a lottery ticket and come home and you find out that you're a millionaire. You didn't work for that money. And guess what happens when you get rich quick? It messes you up. The Bible talks about the love of money is the root of all evil. You know, which some professing have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You get rich quick, you'll be pierced through with many sorrows. You'll make friends that you never knew before. God's will is not for you to gamble your money. And even if you go out and you buy a lottery ticket that costs, I don't even know what they cost, you know, say $5 or something like that, and you make a million on it or something, that's still not God's will. Even if you take $5 a week or something, or buying lottery or whatever, you're still wasting money. Okay? Not God's will for you to be into gambling. And by the way, there are people that get very much addicted to it. Very addicted. You know, and these casinos, that's the kind of people they want coming. They want people coming that are going to spend all the living that they have. They want the prodigal son type of people that come and spend all their inheritance with riotous living. That's what Las Vegas is all about. Riotous living. Okay? Well, you say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I don't have a problem with alcohol or smoking or drugs or pornography or gambling. I'm doing good. Well, stay tuned because <laughs> uh, I'm going to get you today. First Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to go there next. And we're going to talk about the next addiction. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians 5.22 The Bible says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. What's the next addiction? The next addiction is television and movies. The Bible says you're to abstain from all appearance of evil. Where do you get the appearance of evil? The best place to find it is from television. Through movies. And I'll tell you what, the appearance of evil is getting much and much more evil as time goes by. You know, I mean, it's, it's getting bad. Turn next to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, we're going to go to verse 28. Here's some more interesting things. If you want to see the the plan or whatever about how which a nation falls, the steps that a nation goes through, you know, before they collapse, just read Romans chapter one. You'll see it right there. Verse twenty eight. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those to do those things which are not convenient. You want a, a theme verse for Hollywood, right there it is. They don't like to retain God in their knowledge. And so what's God do? God says, okay, reprobate mine. There you go. And to do those things which are not convenient. It's funny, all these Hollywood actors that have such a disdain for God in the Bible, they end up doing those things which are not convenient. Their lives end up being destroyed. Many of them commit suicide quickly other ones commit suicide through a lifetime of drugs you know look at verse 29 being filled with all unrighteousness fornication wickedness covetousness maliciousness full of envy murder debate deceit malignity whisperers backbiters haters of god despiteful proud boasters inventors of evil things disobedient to parents without understanding covenant breakers without natural affection implacable unmerciful who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. I think it's amazing, and, and 
I'll tell you right now, I've seen movies, I've seen, you know, things that I probably shouldn't have seen. I've seen, you know, if I look at that list right there, yeah, I've seen some of that stuff through television and movies, and I have had pleasure in them that do them. You say, oh, it's just pretend, it's not real, real and everything. Yeah, but uh Bible doesn't say, oh, if they're just pretending. Something to think about. We look at this, those verses 29 through 31, and we call it entertainment today. Right. Something to think about. You know, the old thing of, would you watch it if God was sitting there beside you? And people go, well, no, you know, well, he is. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Something to think about. And you say, well, what's that have to do with addiction? Uh, can you stop watching it right in the middle of it? Just when it's getting exciting, can you say, that's enough? Or are you so addicted that you can't shut it off? Something to think about. Can you live without something for a week, for a month? If you can't live without it, you know, for a week... You probably are addicted to it. That's a problem. See, you're being brought under the power of it. And there are people, they can't even go hours without watching. I mean, I know people, I've gone to people's homes, it's on all the time. Yeah. Whether they're in the room or not. Yeah. Shouldn't be that way, that's an addiction. Now, the next addiction... Here we go again. Time to get kicked again. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. What's the next addiction? Video games. Oh boy. Yeah, at one time this would have just dealt with, with uh, kids. Not anymore. Now it goes to adults too. It says here, Second Timothy chapter three, verse one. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Now, are we in last in the last days? Yes. Have perilous times come? Yes. Absolutely. And they're going to get more and more perilous as time goes by. Jump down to verse four. It says here, traitors, heady, high-minded. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. <coughs> Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Okay. Now, a couple things to consider here. Number one, can you play video games for an hour? Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Can you pray or read your Bible for an hour? Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it, uh, physically you can, yeah. but do you? Yeah. yeah, is the question. And I'm going to confess a fault here. The one time, this couple years ago, but I, I was into these video games, these computer games where you build up armies and you have, you know, your little village where you're farming and you're mining things and stuff to finance your army and you build this immense army and then you go invade the other guy's country and, you know, and I was playing it and it was like, I had this immense army built up, you know, and I'm playing against the computer and everything, and and I went over and I'm trying to invade their country, and they, and they'd beat me, and I'd build up another army, and, and I was so into this game, and I finally got the thing done. I mean, my eyes were like bloodshot. I, you know, I'm like, man, what time is it? I looked over at the clock. It was four o'clock in the morning. I must have been playing for five or six hours. You say, where? Well, were you that addicted? Yep. You know what I did? It was just like I I just was so convicted after that. I took the video game out of the out of the computer and I just went snap and broke it. And I just said, "Lord, I'm sorry." And I never fell for video game addiction after that. Right? <laughs> Wrong. There have been other times. It's I mean, it's stupid when you think about it. What does it accomplish? Nothing. It's just entertainment. You know, 
And I'm going to talk about whether it's right or wrong in here in just a minute or two. But the point is, does it bring you under its power? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how is it that you can play that till 4 o'clock in the morning? I could play it till 4 o'clock in the morning. But when's the last time I prayed till 4 o'clock in the morning? Or read my Bible till 4 o'clock in the morning? That's a problem. You know, it's interesting. We sang a song this morning, and I, I picked this on purpose. It's called Take Time to Be Holy. And it's, I'm just going to read the first uh, verse here. It says, Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in him always and feed on his word. You know why so many Christians are so weak and anemic nowadays? Because they don't feed on his word. Uh, make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak. Forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. That's an important thing. You need to take time to be holy. And the next hymn that we're going to sing at the end of this service here, I'm not going to record it, but the next hymn that we're going to sing is Sweet Hour of Prayer. When's the last time you had a sweet hour of prayer? Does 10 minutes seem like a long time to you in prayer? Something to think about. Uh, another thing to consider on the thing of video games. Uh, we read there in, in verse 5, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. How much spiritual power do you have? Would you like to have spiritual power? Or would you rather beat the level in a video game? Spiritual power takes time. Okay, it takes a lot of study. It takes a lot of prayer. And believe me, I'm getting kicked just as bad as any of you are out there. I mean, don't don't get excited that I'm just attacking you personally. You you do your own kicking, you know. God knows your heart and you know what's going on there in your own life. Nobody can judge you but yourself in this matter. But the fact is, if you want to do something for the Lord, it's going to require your time. Okay? But now what about entertainment, since I'm on the subject? Webster's 1828 Dictionary. We're going to read the second definition here. It says, quote, The amusement, pleasure, or instruction derived from conversation, discourse, argument, oratory, music, dramatic performances, etc. The pleasure which, which the mind receives from anything interesting and which holds or rests the attention we often have rich entertainment in the conversation of a learned friend. <laughs> Again, entertainment has changed a lot <laughs> over the years. Uh, now, if you notice there in verse 4 of 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, Lovers of pleasure, more pleasures more than lovers of God. It does not say lovers of pleasures. It just says more than lovers of God. Now, if you spend your entire day serving the Lord and you're doing good for the Lord and whatever, and you just say, I just want to sit down and watch a, a neat video about nature, about whatever, or just go play some games or, or something like that, or even play an innocent video game. you know. And you spent six hours, eight hours serving the Lord and you sit down and you play a video game for an hour. You're not a lover of pleasure more than a lover of God at that point. Okay? The problem is, you know, I'm not against video games. I'm not against, you know, some movies and things like that. I'm not against those things. Where I'm against it is when they start to pull you under their power and you're spending more time with them than you are with the Lord. Then it becomes a problem. I'm not saying that you have to just be some kind of a monk and just do nothing but read the Bible and pray. And, you know, there are times when entertainment is okay. In fact, you need to get away sometimes and just enjoy life and go for a walk in nature or go fishing or whatever else that stuff's fine but if it's coming before your walk with the lord if you are loving pleasure and spending more time in pleasure than you are with god then it's a problem and it can become an addiction i mean there are many stories which i've read and things of people there was a guy in japan the one time i read about that actually was playing a video game non-stop for like three days. And it ended up, he, you know, I guess stopped just for a minute to go to the bathroom. And they found him dead in the bathroom. His body just couldn't take anymore. 
You know, he literally destroyed himself playing video games. What a way to go into eternity, you know, <laughs> down in hell, you know, and what are you here for? Well, I killed somebody. What are you here for? Well, you know, I was, uh, died of a drug overdose. What about you? Well, I was playing video games for three days. <laughs> not a good idea. So, okay, you say, well, I'm still not guilty. You know, I don't have a problem with TV. I don't have a problem with video games. Well, get ready for another kick. What about caffeine? Can you be addicted to caffeine? Yep. Turn to Psalm chapter seven or Psalm seventeen. Excuse me, there aren't any chapters in Psalm. Psalm seventeen. Psalm seventeen, verse fifteen. Say, boy, I just can't get going in the morning without my cup of coffee. Or some people without my soda. Psalm 17, verse 15 says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Turn to Psalm 57. Psalm 57, verse 7. When you awake, what's the first thing that you think about? Something you need to think about there. Psalm 57, verse 7. It says here, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds now you say well this is different you know david lived back in a time when there was no pollution and there was no you know electronic smog and whatever else yeah i know that you can't compare yourself totally to a time when people everything they ate was organic there was no pollution there was no you know electric stuff going on i know that I'm aware of that. You know, you're we're not going to be quite as energetic as people were back then, you know. See, it's the opposite of evolution. We're not getting better, we're getting worse. Uh, and the Lord's going to have to restore this earth someday. But the point is, what's your condition when you get up? Some people say, "Well, I'm just not a morning person." Well, many times people that aren't morning persons, uh, it's because they're night people. And they're staying up too late and they're not getting enough sleep. Again, I'm being kicked here. Okay? Friday night I was up working until 1.30 in the morning. You know, Saturday morning I guess that would be actually. You know, last night I was up till after midnight. There are times I just got work to do and I put it off and put it off and then I end up being up really late and I get four or five hours of sleep and it just doesn't work. You know? Now, I don't have a problem with caffeine. I'll tell you that right now. I drink a cup of tea in the morning with breakfast, but I can take it or leave it. And that's all I drink, you know. I don't drink it all day long. But what about these people that they just have to have their cup of coffee and they end up drinking a pot or two a day? It's not good for you. It's not good. And it's kind of a sign of something else being wrong. If it if you have to have caffeine to get yourself going, you're probably not eating right. You're probably not getting enough sleep. There's some problems there. And, you know, I've I've heard of stories of people that I heard about a woman the one time that basically lived on coffee and cigarettes. You know, and she'd eat occasionally, you know, every couple of days or something, but just eating or just smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee all the time. That's bad. I mean, that's it's incredible and there are people that are like that okay it's just something that that's a sign of of things you know being bad uh as far as another thing about caffeine is soda you know there again i know people that drink a lot of soda i myself used to do that you know i was working at a factory at one point in time and i'd buy a a case of dr pepper and i would drink three or four of them a day you know it's wrecking my health. 
It's not good for you. And the funny thing is, it wasn't even quenching my thirst. <laughs> you know, it made it worse. I mean, if you're living on soda, especially diet soda, that stuff is, man, toxic. Bad stuff. You say, well, you know, but still, I, I, you know, I, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Is it bringing you under its power? Remember what we read earlier, 1 Corinthians 6, 12? You know, are you bring, being brought under the power of caffeine? Something to think about. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go on to the next one. Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. Now we're going to look at the next addiction. How about gluttony? Proverbs chapter 23 verse 1 says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is set, or what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. You know, back in the past... The common man basically ate what he could grow or what he could hunt or what he could, what he could catch. The kings were the ones that were getting all the delicate foods, all the imported type of stuff. But guess what? Here in America, we all eat better than kings did hundreds of years ago. And the things that were considered dainties and deceitful meat now is part of our common diet. Most things that you can grow or that you can hunt or that, you know, most things from nature that you can eat are going to be good for you. You say, but they're high in fat. Yeah, but the fat's good if you're working hard, Amen. as we talked about earlier. Those things are good for you. But when you start getting into these dainties and deceitful meat, that's where you're going to start having problems. And the Bible says there, if you are... Given a man given to appetite, you should put a knife to your throat. Now, you don't have to literally do that. You know, if you're invited out to eat or something, and somebody says, would you like a chocolate? You know, don't pull your pocket knife out and stick it to your throat or something. I mean, you don't have to do that. But the point is, you should think that way. You should say, oh, no, 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 thank you. No, I don't want any of that. And I mean, you know, I can't go off on a, a big thing here, big tangent, but study some of the stuff that's in this in candy or some of these other things, the processed type of food, it's a step or two above poison. <laughs> it's bad for you. You know? And you can become addicted. There's a lot of people that are addicted to certain types of foods. And it can lead to problems, weight problems. Something you need to think about as a Christian. Okay? And you say, what about you, Brian? Are you always in control? Are you always, you know, only eat the best foods? No, unfortunately, I don't. There are times when I should put a knife to my throat, and I don't. <coughs> there are times when I say, oh, just, you know, just one. You know, I'll tell you a little story here. I probably said this in other sermons, but one of the things that I am trying to cure myself of ever eating is chocolate. <laughs> because when I eat chocolate, I get a headache. And it lasts all day, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can take headache medication, you know, Excedrin, aspirin, Tylenol, whatever. doesn't matter. Until that stuff's out of your system, out of my system, I have a headache. It's just not worth it. But there are many times when I'll just, well, maybe this once. <laughs> and then I pay the whole next day. You know? Why is it? Well, it sure looks good. Smells good. You smell that chocolate aroma oh man that really looks good what is it it's deceitful don't eat it and that's something by the way i just want to say something else here quick before we continue and that is uh first corinthians chapter 9 verse 27 says but i keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means when i have preached to others i myself should be a castaway as a christian you do need to keep yourself in reasonably good shape I say reasonably good because sometimes in ministry you aren't going to be able to eat the best foods and get the most exercise and everything else. Sometimes you're going to have to sacrifice your health a little bit. But the point is you should do what you can to prevent yourself from getting sick. 
we have it all wrong here in America. We have health care, which is I'm going to live how I want to live, and then when I get sick, the doctor will fix me. That's not the way it's supposed to be. And you shouldn't be that way as a Christian in your relationship with God. You don't say, I'm just going to live in sin, and then when I get messed up, <clears throat> then God will fix everything for me. And you'll see that. A good example would be uh, smoking. You know, the Christian smokes and smokes and smokes, and all of a sudden they feel kind of funny. They go to the doctor, and the doctor says you have cancer. And then they say, please pray for me that God will heal me of my cancer. Uh, well, you shouldn't have started smoking in the first place. If you live like that, if you live, live after the flesh, ye shall die, the Bible says. You know, you got to watch out for that stuff. You need to avoid sin, and you need to un avoid unhealthy eating. Okay, Make it a life of prevention, not of I want to be cured now because I lived in sin. You need to have prevention. Okay. All right, now what about the next addiction? We're going to go on to the next one. Uh, you can... Actually, I'm just going to read these scriptures. What about debt? Can people be addicted to getting in debt? Yes. Yeah. Especially here in America. Uh, Romans chapter 13, verse 8 says, O no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Okay, so you shouldn't totally get rid of debt. You should be indebted to other people in love. Okay, but that's not the same thing as being in debt to a crooked bank. <laughs> you know, uh, Proverbs chapter 22, verse 7 says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. There are a lot of people that are so far into debt that they're a servant. They're a slave. And I know of people that they never get out of debt. They'll go and they'll get a new car, and they'll have it for a couple years, and they just make payments on it, and then they, they go to the dealership and say, okay, time for a new car. And they make payments on that, and then they go and they get another car, and then they go and, and they just perpetual debt. We have a lot of farms in this area here, the Amish people, and a lot of those farms... They never pay the debt off. They just they pass down the farm from one generation to the next, and you just keep making bank payments. Shouldn't be that way. Why? Because you're a servant to the lender. And the worst thing out there is credit cards. And I have seen, you know, there are some of the brethren that, that have credit cards, and they they keep the thing paid up, you know, month to month. Me, I'm not going to gamble. Amen. You know, I'm not going to mess with it. Yeah. No thank you. <laughs> I know my, my flesh, I know the fact that I want to have something and I don't want to wait to get the money. And if I had a credit card, I'd be like, well, you know, I think I'm going to be making enough this month to pay for this, so I'll buy it right now. Now think about that as a Christian. Is that really something that you should be involved with? You don't have to wait on the Lord if you have a credit card. You don't have to pray that the Lord will give you the money to buy something. You can just go out and <clears throat> credit card and there are people that go through credit card debt and they have they have to declare bankruptcy and everything and it's a horrible or, ordeal and they finally get out of the thing and they go right back into it. And I I'll just tell you this, I have very low income, uh low yearly income and I get advertisements all the time for platinum credit cards <laughs> with a $1000 spending limit. <laughs> it's like why are they sending it to me? Because Proverbs 22, 7. The rich ruleth over the poor. They want to rule over me. They want me to be their servant. The borrower's servant to the lender. Don't borrow money. If you don't have it, don't spend it. Brian, are you condemning the American way of life? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, and, and let me just say this, and, and just a little side note type of a thing. I know to buy a home and things like that, there are some of the brethren that have a mortgage and, and payments and things. It's almost impossible with our current corrupt system to be able to buy a home and, and whatever without going into debt. Okay, I'm not condemning all of that. All right, I understand that. But And there are people out there that have a mortgage that are that are making their payments, they're staying out of debt, they're living a very frugal life. That's fine. But I'm talking about people that are just totally getting into debt and not caring about it. That's wrong. You become a servant to the lender. 
First Timothy chapter six verses uh, six through eight says, "But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content." So, according to the Bible, all you really need to survive is food and clothing. Raiment is the word there. Okay, you say, "Well, I have other things." Well, then that's a bonus from God. Be thankful for it. Okay? And again, kick thine own self. <laughs> you know? Uh, now, last part of the sermon here. Are there any good addictions? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. <clears throat> Problem that a lot of people have is they try to overcome their addictions. And many times that they do... But your flesh is prone to sin. And so what often happens is you overcome an addiction and it is replaced with another bad addiction. Okay? And a lot of these people around here, we have a lot of, you know, Amish and Mennonite and conservative types of people. And they look, you know, very, oh, they're really overcoming the flesh. They really have, you know, good standards and things. And they might not have a problem with TV. They might not have a problem with alcohol or drugs or cigarettes or whatever else. But I guarantee you they have other problems with their flesh. Okay? You can't get to a point where you totally eliminate all sins of your flesh. Your flesh is always going, going to be prone to sin. It's always going to be there. So what do you do? Well, let's see here. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15 says here, I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Right there is what you need to be doing. You don't eliminate addictions, you replace addictions. Okay, you don't eliminate things, uh, problems and things like that, you replace them. You could make yourself so busy, you addict yourself into so many other things of the Lord that you don't have time for the bad addictions. Okay? You say, well, uh, what are some good addictions? Well, we talked about it earlier. Prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18 says, pray without ceasing. Now, if you do something without ceasing, could you call that an addiction? Yep. What is it? You're addicting yourself to the ministry of the saints. You know, there are plenty of people out there that need prayer. <laughs> you know, I mean, write down sometime everything that you could pray for and then go through that list. It'll probably probably take you an hour or so. You know, pray for this ministry if you don't, you know, know what to pray for. <laughs> you know, pray for us. We could use it. Uh, verse 18, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. After you get done praying for the Christians, for the ministry of the saints, then start praying and giving God thanks for everything that he's blessed you with. That ought to take you a while. Can you walk? Can your fingers work? Can they move? Can you see? Can you hear? You know, do you have food and raiment? Give thanks. You should not have a problem praying for an hour. Okay? Something to think about there. Okay, what about another addiction? Reading the Bible and Bible-related books. A lot of good books out there that will help you in your understanding of the Bible. Okay, uh, 1 Timothy 4.13 says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. You should read as a Christian. There are a lot of good things that you can study. And now today we have a new thing there of video. And of course you have to be careful. You don't want to go into the entertainment thing. But you can learn a lot through preaching, hearing, listening to sermons. You know, we have a lot of audio things out there. Sermon audio, of course. You can learn some good stuff on there. Um, a lot of good resources that you can really addict yourself to. And become addicted to hearing the Word of God you know, the Alexander Scorby recordings of the King James Bible. Become addicted to it. You know, well, I'd rather listen to some, some neat, you know, popular music of today. Don't waste your time on that stuff. Addict yourself to 
the right types of things to listen to, the right types of things to read. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay? You need to study so that God can use you. Number three, how about another ministry to addict yourself to? Start a soul winning ministry. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Why are you wise if you win souls? Because it's something eternal. Okay, and you say, well, I just don't have the courage to go up to people and just start opening up conversations. I didn't say that. I said start a soul winning ministry. People have this idea that a soul winner is somebody that goes and knocks on doors and thinks some people do that and they are, they're good at it. Some people are good at just going up and walking through a park and handing out tracts. Some, some people are good to just walk up to somebody in a grocery store and start witnessing to them. Some people are good at that. Other people aren't. Don't feel pressured by the guys that do it in more of a confrontational way. You don't have to be that way. There are a lot of other things that you can do to win souls. Okay, You can get a website. You can put salvation things on there. Type out articles. You know, you can send in letters to the editor. Of course, you're going to get kicked there, but it's good for you. You know, you can lay out tracks. You don't even have to give them to people. Just go someplace, lay tracks around, work your way up. Okay, one of the big mistakes that a lot of Christians make is they feel pressured. They get some evangelist up there yelling and screaming in church and tell them, if you're not winning souls, you're probably not saved or something. No, no. Don't get pressured into doing something right away, you know, going from no soul winning ministry to I'm going to be full time, big time. That works for some people, but it doesn't work for others. Work your way up slow. Everybody can go and lay a tract someplace. Everybody can just write, put a comment on an internet thing. You know, there are a lot of things that you can do. Work your way up. And the more of soul winning ministry you do the more bold you will become and it'll become easier to start talking to people talking to friends talking to relatives talking to people you run into pray that the lord opens doors of opportunity but if you are making that a thing that you're doing on a daily basis see and you begin to say i can't live without doing this i want to addict myself to this you're going to start seeing that the other sinful addictions are going to start to diminish. Why? Because you're feeding the spirit and not the flesh. And if you live after the spirit, it will go to rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. You'll start doing things for the Lord. See, don't try to just eliminate all your sins and live as a sinless person down here. It's never going to work. Now, if you have an alcohol problem or cigarettes or drugs or something or pornography, something bad, yeah, you do need to eliminate that. You do need to work hard at overcoming that addiction and the other ones too. But the best way I've found to do it is not to threaten yourself, not to tell yourself you're probably not even saved. You're probably going to hell. You know, if you know you're saved, you're sure that you're saved. You know, what you need to do is you need to be addicted to the right types of things. Okay. Um, I have here, last thing I want to say is that you need to become so addicted to the things of the Lord. Praying, reading your Bible, witnessing, things like that. Listening to the right types of music. You need to become so addicted to those that you don't want to live one day without doing them. And if you can start doing that, in time, you'll overcome the other addictions if you have a problem there. The problem is when you start to forsake this book and when you start to forsake prayer and when you stop witnessing to people and you stop sticking your neck out for the Lord, that's when the other addictions are going to come up. That's when you're going to start struggling with the sins of the flesh. So that's going to be it for this morning. Um... As I've stated in many other messages, we are living in perilous times, as the Bible says. Don't expect to get a, an easy ride through life as a Christian. Okay, the world is your enemy, <laughs> not your friend. And there are many things out there that they're going to try to get you addicted to, to draw you away from the Bible. 
So pray, read your Bible, study, become addicted to the things of the Lord. Okay? And you will be able to overcome your sinful addictions. So that's it. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.